So today we will uh, explain the, uh, uh, we'll start explaining chapter four, that is about MARI. So, and MARI is a very simple computer architecture. So we will introduce a simple computer called MARI. So to start, before explaining what is MARI in the second point, let us introduce, okay, uh, what we will find in chapter four, that is, in fact, in chapter one, two, three, you got familiar with, with some terms related to a computer hardware. We've seen, for example, what is called what is von Neumann model. Okay, how the CPU is connected to the memory, to the input-output systems. We've seen uh, how to cal make calculations using binary numbers. That is the job of the arithmetic logic unit inside the processor. Okay. And we've also seen what is a register when we talked about the sequential circuits. <coughs> that is also a main part in the central process unit. So in this chapter, in this introduction, we will see how we can combine all these components, how all these components interact with each other to create the computer system. Okay? So this is uh, what is called the von Neumann model. So this is a reminder to show you that in any computer, in any recent computer, current computer, we have a central process unit with three main parts, the arithmetic logic unit, control unit, and the registers, connected to the main memory, okay, and we have input-output systems. And recall that we have what is called the von Neumann cycle, that is the fetch, decode, and execute cycle. So during fetch, the CPU goes to the memory and gets an instruction. Okay, then it decodes it, okay, it makes the decoding to know what to do, and then it will execute. So for instance, if we have an addition instruction, the, the control unit gives its orders to the arithmetic logic unit to make the calculations, okay? So, in this von Neumann architecture, we have several parts. Now we will classify them into two main categories, okay? The first category is called the data path. So it's a category that groups all components in the CPU except the control unit. Okay, so in the data path, we will find the arithmetic logic unit, registers, and data buses. And I will explain in details what is a bus. Okay? And the second category is the control unit, that is the brain of the CPU. So if the CPU is the brain of the computer, the control unit is the brain of the brain. Okay, the brain of the CPU. Now, registers, so when we find the registers, so now we are trying to explain the contents of the data path, okay? For example, the first uh, element in the data path are registers. For example, a register is an elementary memory, so it can store usually one word, okay? And when we say word, this means that we have a computer, we already explained that. We have a 32-bit computer, so a register inside the CPU has a length of 32 bits, okay? So the elementary memory in this case in the uh, CPU has 32 bits. Now we have two types of registers inside the CPU, okay? We have two types of elementary memories. The first type is called general purpose register, and the second one is special purpose registers. So as their name suggests, general purpose registers are registers that can memorize any general thing. For example, if I have a variable, I can store it inside the general purpose register. So if the CPU has to add two operands, for example, the operands will be stored in the general purpose register. Okay? The second category is the special purpose register. So in this case, the register has a special, special purpose. For instance, we've already seen an example of a special special purpose register. Who can remind us? Okay, when, we, uh, when we've seen the von Neumann architecture. Okay, here we have a, uh, an example of special purpose register. We have only one register with one name. That is the program counter. So this is a typical example of a special purpose register. What does this mean? In fact, a user or a programmer cannot change the value or can change the value of the program counter, but this program counter has a uh, special 
purpose. Okay, the program counter indicates the address of the next instruction, and it's always like that. Okay, but sometimes in a general purpose register, sometimes you will have an operand, and other time you will have another job, for example, in a general purpose register. But here, in a special purpose register, the register will always have the same purpose. Other examples of special purpose register are index register and status registers, and we will see these when we go further in uh, explaining T103 course. So I already explained that and said that registers usually has a has a length of a word size. Okay? So if we have a 16-bit computer, 32 or 64-bit computer, this means that the register inside the CPU has usually 64 bits, for instance, if you are using a 64-bit computer. So why registers are located inside the CPU? Okay, why we find the register inside the CPU and not outside to quickly access the content of these registers? The idea is to make the computer faster and faster. So to make it so, we need elementary memory that can be directly accessed by the CPU, by the control unit, and the arithmetic logic unit. So this is why registers are located inside the CPU. Now the second part of the uh, data path category, the arithmetic logic unit. So arithmetic logic unit makes arithmetical and logical operations. Arithmetic if you want to add, subtract, multiply, or logical if you want to make a logical operation such as AND or that we've discussed in details in chapter 2. So then we have the second category, okay, that is the category of the control unit, that is as we explained, this is the brain of the CPU, so it's a kind of policeman or traffic manager, so the control unit will give the orders for different parts inside the CPU, so for registers and for the arithmetic logic unit. So the one of the jobs of the control unit is also to fetch, decode the, uh, the instructions and also to monitor the execution, okay? So this is why we call a control unit the brain of the CPU. Now what is a bus? Okay, recall a bus is a part of the data path. Okay, so what is a, the bus? The bus is a kind of lines, of wires, okay, of copper wires, but printed on the CPU. Okay, well now you will not see wires, okay, uh, like traditional wire we've seen here. No, it's a printed wire that is on uh, a flat uh, printed circuit board, okay, on the integrated circuit. Um, so a bus is like that, so lines, okay, that connects several uh, components. It can connect two components or more, as we will see later on. So we have in fact two kinds of buses, a point-to-point -point or a common pathway. So a point-to-point -point bus is a bus that connects only two points, as we can see in this picture. So if I want to connect a serial port to a modem, I will have a bus okay, that connects these points, okay, only two points. The second one is the uh, multi-point bus, okay, that is a bus that connects several components together. Okay? So if the, uh, this controller of the monitor, for example, needs to send a da data for memory, it sends it on this bus. And furthermore, if the CPU wants to send a data for the memory, it will use the same bus. So we need a protocol or a way to manage how devices share the same bus. Okay? So because uh, we cannot send at the same time two data from two different components. Only one can use the bus at a time. So from these lines, okay, in this bus, okay, we will have some lines that are dedicated for data, other lines dedicated for address, and other lines dedicated for control lines. So what does this mean? In fact, data lines, okay, data lines or data bus, that is a part of the bus, called data bus, okay, it's used to send only data, okay, unlike an address bus that is used to send only addresses. So we will explain in details what is the difference between address and bus when we will explain today the memory inside the computer systems. But now keep in mind that 
address is different from data, and we will explain later on why. So this is why we need two different buses for address and data. Now, control bus, since we can have a bus shared between several devices, we need a way to control the access of this bus to this bus, and this is why we need control lines. Okay? In addition to these, we have power lines that supply power for the buses. Okay? Electricity. Now, we've seen that we can say this is a data bus, address bus, and control lines, but also we can give a name for the bus depending on the components it is connecting. So, for instance, we have what is called a processor memory bus, so this is a bus dedicated to connect the processor with the memory. Okay, while well we have input-output buses, so these are buses that connect input-outputs to the CPU. Now, clocks, we've already seen what is a clock when we uh, explain sequential circuits. Okay, so we've seen that a clock is a kind of uh, cyclical uh, signal, okay, electrical signal that is cyclical, so it repeats itself. We have the same shape that is repeating. Uh, any computer system, any today's computer system, need a world to operate. Okay? And we have explained that in lecture one when we said that each processor has a clock speed, okay? that is 2 gigahertz or 2.5 gigahertz, to say what is the speed of the clock of the CPU. Okay? And on each clock tick, the CPU will make one single job. Okay? So we call clock frequency, that is somehow the speed of the uh, uh, clock. So recall that the clock is a signal like that. Okay, and during each cycle, this is one cycle. Okay, and each cycle has a duration in time called period. So this, that is the time needed for only one cycle. This is the period. Now frequency will be how much cycles I have per second. Okay? That is and is somehow the speed of the signal. So it's one over t. Okay? And the frequency is measured in hertz while the time is measured in seconds. Okay? So for example, if we have a computer system with a clock speed of 800 megahertz, this means that the period is 1 over t, that is 1 over 800 times 10 power 6, since here this is a speed and mega uh, means a the power of 10, okay? It's not a storage capacity. So in this case, we will have 1.25 nanoseconds, okay, recall nano is a 10 power minus 9. Okay, so when we divide this number by one, this number, one over this number, we will have 1.25 times 10 power minus 9, and we can replace 10 power minus 9 by nanoseconds. Okay? Is there anything not clear? Okay. So this is another example, but here you have the period and you need to calculate the frequency. Okay, obviously, if time equal 1 over f, or f equal 1 over t, so t will be 1 over f, and vice versa. Okay? So if t equal 1 over f, f will be 1 over t. Okay. So here I skipped some slides, okay? And um, I, keep, uh, I want to explain only the uh, main idea of these three slides, in fact. We've already said that if you buy a computer with a uh, clock speed, with a processor clock speed of 2 gigahertz, this doesn't mean that it would be better than another one with 2.1 gigahertz, for example. And we've explained why before. I remind you that this is due, in fact, to the number of cycles needed to execute one instruction. So we've said that a computer system or a CPU to make, for example, one addition, it might need more than one cycle, okay? So in fact, the time needed to execute an instruction Okay, will be equal to the number of cycles needed 
per extraction times the time needed for one cycle. Okay? So, for example, to make an addition, to make an add instruction, I will explain that later on. To make an add instruction, for example, we need three cycles or three clock ticks. And if we use a clock speed with uh, 800 megahertz, that is equal to 800 megahertz, this means that time is 1.25 nanoseconds for only one cycle. So if we need three cycles to make add, the time needed to make an add instruction is three times 1.25. Okay? So this is what is explained here. But it's uh, generalized to calculate the number of or the time needed to uh, execute a full program. So here we don't have only one instruction, we have an assembly program with several instructions, with a given number of instructions. So to calculate the time needed to execute a program, it will be how many instructions per program do we have, times the number of cycles per instruction, the average cycles per instruction, and then times the cycles, uh, the seconds per cycle. Okay, how many time I need to execute one cycle. Is, it, is this clear? Okay. So now, why we take the average cycle? Why we don't say that this is the number of cycles per instruction? And we, uh, rather than, we've taken the average cycle number per instruction. Okay. Simply because an instruction, two different instructions can need different number of cycles to be executed. Okay. So for example, add needs three cycles, but perhaps subtract needs more than three cycles. So in general, we take the average number of cycles, okay? Now very briefly, we will discuss input-output subsystem and the interrupts, and we will focus on the memory organization and addressing. So any computer system has an input-output. So if I want to input something to the computer, I need an input device, and if I want to output something, I need an output device such as the screen, for example. So, in fact, in a computer system, how a CPU deals with input outputs? We have two ways to deal with these input outputs. The first way is called memory mapped, and the second one is called instruction based. All that you need to do to know is the difference between the two concepts. For instance, what we, so what does a memory map mean? When input output is memory mapped, the computer system or the CPU deals with this input output device as a part of the main memory, of the random access memory. So if I want to write something on an output device, I will not send it directly to the output device, but I will store it in the memory, and the input output device will take it from the memory. Okay? So we have the memory between the CPU and the input output device. But if we have an input output device that is instruction based, the CPU can directly communicate with the input output device without using the perhaps the uh, random access memory, okay? So it sends the instructions, or, or it, the CPU has instructions that are dedicated to the input output devices, as we will see for the Marie architecture that we will explain today, okay? Now, one of the most important parts of this lecture, okay, and perhaps uh, not evident, is how memory is uh, organized inside a computer system, okay? And here when we say memory, okay, we are, uh, what, we, what interests us is the main memory, so the random access memory that is inside the computer system. Okay, so keep that in mind, we are not taking into consideration the secondary memory, we will focus on the main memory of the computer system. So, how it looks like a memory inside a computer system? You can see it as a matrix inside the computer. So a memory is a kind of matrix. So this matrix contains lines and columns, okay? In each line, we can store usually one word, okay? So I remind you, one word, word length is the length of the registers inside the CPU, general purpose register. So by default, usually computer systems 
can store in each line one more. Okay, we have two different concepts. I will explain them later. One byte, what is called address, uh, byte addressable and word addressable. So each location, each line, one more. Okay, but we can also have other architecture where in each line we have only eight bits. And I will explain that. Okay, but for now, consider that in each line we have one more. Okay, so number of lines will give us how many words we can store in this, in this memory, okay? And number of columns is the word length. So typically, uh, if you want to represent a memory, okay, let me show you just one example, we will express it like that, okay? So we will say that we have four meg times 16 memory. So what does this mean? That we have four mega lines times 16 is how many bits per line we have, okay? Now, what is the difference between what is called a byte addressable main memory and a word addressable main memory? So we already explained what is a word addressable main memory. So if I have a word addressable memory, each line will contain only one word, okay? But if we have byte addressable main memory, this means that each line can only store 8 bits, okay, one byte. So going back, we will find that an address, a, a byte addressable memory is like that, so we'll always have 8 bits. Even if the word size inside the computer system is bigger than 8, we will still have a memory, if it's at byte addressable, that contains only 8 bits, okay? But if we have a word addressable memory, in each line we will have one word, okay? So for us, as human beings, it's easier for us to treat, a, to use a word-based, okay, word-addressable main memory. It's not better, no. Any computer systems, any architecture of the computer can be byte-addressable, memory can be byte-addressable or uh, word-addressable, okay? It depends on the architecture, okay? But for us, as human beings, we can understand a word addressable better than, easier than uh, a byte addressable. Now, what if we have a computer system with a word size more than eight bits, but we still have a byte addressable main memory? What do you think, how do you think we can store the content of a register? So I'll explain my question. I'll really explain my question. We have So the lowest address will determine the address of the entire world in the main memory. Now, one of the questions, important questions, uh, that you might ask 
yourself, if you buy a computer, is how many bits I need to address one location. Okay? And this is given by, in fact, several factors. This depends on several factors. It depends on the type of addressing. So, is it a byte addressable or a word addressable? It depends on the word size, how many words, how many bits I have in one word, and it depends on the storage capacity of the memory. Let's take uh, an example to show you how we can calculate the number of bits we need to address one memory location. So suppose that we have a 4 meg times 16 word addressable memory inside the computer. And they are asking us how this memory is organized. Okay, how this memory is organized means how many locations do we have and how many bits do we need to address one location inside this memory. So remember that 4 meg times 16 word addressable means that the word size is 16, okay, and we have 4 meg lines, okay, if it's word addressable. So how we can calculate, in fact, at first what we need to do is to find how many locations do we have, how many lines do we have in the main memory, okay? In fact, 4 meg times 16, when we say 4 meg times 16, this is the capacity, how many bits of storage, or how many bits we can store inside this memory. Okay? This is typically, or basically, this is in bits. So even if they don't say that this is a 4 meg times 16 bits, this is bits. Okay, this is expressed in bits. So we can calculate, in fact, this is equal to 4 meg. Okay, this is, this is capacity, omega is 2 power. 20 times 16, that is 2 power 4, and here we have 2 power 2, so this is equal to 2 power 26 bits. Okay? So how many bits we can store in this memory? 2 power 26 bits. Now, this is the number of bits. So, how many locations do I have inside this memory? To know how many locations, I need to divide the number of bits, the capacity of the memory, number of bits I have inside this memory, by the number of bits per line to deduce the number of how many locations I have. So what I need to do, the number of locations is equal to 4 meg times 16 over, let's give the formula before, size, memory size, So at this moment I'm saying word size because it's these word size, okay, because it's a word addressable memory, okay? But I will avoid using this term and I will use instead number of bits per location. So when I say location, this means one location in the memory, one line. Okay, I can say line, location, or address. Okay, all these mean the same thing. And I will explain later on why I'm using this term and not the word size. So if we have a word addressable memory, this means that in this example, the memory size is 4 meg times 16 bits. Over how many bits per location do we have? This is defined by the word size. Okay, since it's word addressable. So in each location I have 16 bits. So dividing by 16, we will have 4 meg locations. Okay, I repeat locations or addresses, both are correct. So since we have 4 meg, so 4 meg is equal to 4 times 2 power 20, that is 2 power 22, okay, since meg is 2 power 20, okay, and 4 is 2 power 2. So, this takes us now to how many address bits, or how many addresses I have, and then how many bits I need to address one location. So, in fact, if I have 2 power 22 addresses, 
So here we have 2 power, uh, if we have 2 power 22 locations, this means that we have 2 power 22 locations. So if we give a number for each location, I will say that this is the location number 0, this is 1, and so on. The higher the last one will be 2 power 22 minus 1. This will begin with 0. Okay? Now, how many bits I need to represent the last address, okay, the last location, or the address of the last location? I need, in fact, since I use 2 power 22, so I need 22 bits, okay, to represent this one, okay? So what we will do in a computer system, the address will always have the same length, that is the length of the highest address, okay? So if we have 2 power 22 minus 1, we need 22 bits, okay, and hence the addresses start with all zeros, 22 zeros, and the highest address will be 22 ones, okay? So in this picture, okay, let's summarize. In this picture, this is the physical memory, okay? It's showing the locations inside the memory. For each location, we have an address, okay? We cannot see, inside the computer, we cannot see the address, okay? This is just to show you that each one, each location has an address, okay? Inside the memory, what we will have is data, okay? So these are the addresses. This is the address of this location, and this is the data included inside location number one. Okay? So, for example, if the CPU needs to read a data from location number one, it sends the address on the address bus, okay, to the memory. The CPU goes to this address, okay, so goes to this address, then make a copy of the data inside this location and send it to the CPU on the data bus, okay? So keep in mind, please, that we have two different notations. Address is different than data inside memory. Now, how if we have a memory that is byte addressable but the word size, for example, is more than 1 8 byte, for example, uh, 8 bits, for example, 32 bits. So in this case, they are giving us a memory that is 2 max times 32. This means that the CPU register has 32 bits, and the memory size is 2 max times 32 bits. How many locations do we have? If the memory is byte addressable, or how many bit li or address lines do we need? If this memory is byte addressable or is word addressable, okay? So I will start with word addressable because I already explained that and then I will go back to the first question that is if it's a byte addressable. So if it's word addressable, all that we need to do is to divide the capacity using this formula by the word length, okay? Because each location contains only one word. So we have 2 max times 32, dividing this number by 32, we will have 2 max that is equal to 2 times 2 power 20, that is 2 power 21. So how many lines do we need? We need 21 lines to address this memory. So each address is a 21-bit binary number. Now what if the memory is byte addressable? Okay? If the memory is byte addressable, we will still use the same formula, saying that the number of locations is equal to the memory size over the number of bits per location. But in this case, the number of bits per location is not one more, it's not 32 bits, it's always 8, because the memory is byte addressable. So what we will do, we will divide this capacity by 8 bits, okay, so we'll divide it by 8, 32 over 8 equals 4, okay, and we will find that this is equal to 8 max, that is 2 power 3 times 2 power 20, that is 2 power 23 locations, okay. So in this case, this is equal to 2 power 23 bytes, okay, and since each location contains 1 byte, so we need 2 power 23 locations, okay. So how many bits do we need here? We need 23 bits, okay, which is evident because we use, we are using a smaller uh, location size, okay? So we need more, we have more locations and hence we need more bits to address them. Is this clear? Now, final point regarding the memory organization and addressing is usually in a computer memory, in a computer system RAM, is not contained in only one integrated circuit. Even if you buy one chip, this chip contains several integrated circuits, several parts, okay? 
So, in fact, what we, we try to do is to create a memory with a big capacity with smaller memories, with a smaller random access memory. For example, if we have a 32K times 16 word addressable memory that is constructed using only 2K times 8 RAM chips, how can we create this uh, chip? So we have how we can create this memory. So we need to create a memory that is 32K times 16 word addressable. Okay, but we only have chips that are 2K times 8 RAM. Okay, so what does this mean? I need a word size of 16 while the chips we have has a word size, okay, are, contains only 8 bits per line, okay? So at first, to create one word, I need to put two chips, okay, on a single line, okay? To create 16 bits per line, I need 8 bits here and 8 bits here, okay? So typically, what you need to, know, to do is to divide 16 over 8, and this gives you Two, our number of chips, how many columns of chips do we have? Now secondly, how many chips, how many rows of chips do we need? In fact, we need a 32K, but we only have 2K. So how many chips do we have? We will divide 32K by 2K. Okay, and this will give us 16. So we need 16 line of chips. Okay? Final point before, before we go to uh, Marie architecture, explain the Marie architecture uh, uh, is related to interrupts. So what is an interrupt? As its name suggests, is, it's a signal that interrupts the execution of a program. Okay? So if I have a program that is being executed, when interrupt occurs, the CPU stops the execution of the current program okay, and go to treat the program of the interrupt, related to the interrupt, okay? So very simply, an interrupt is a signal that interrupts the work of a processor, okay? What can create an interrupt? A simple uh, input device, a simple output device can create a, an interrupt. For example, if I move the mouse, okay, I need to uh, instantly change the position of the pointer. So in fact, when I move the mouse, the mouse sends an interrupt to the CPU so that the CPU treats the pointer movement on the screen. Okay? We have other types of interrupts that are what we, we call them non-maskable interrupts, such as if you have a problem in your computer, some program is not responding, what you do? What do you do? If there is a program that is not working, the first thing you will do is to close this program, but how do you do that? Do you ever use Control Alt Delete yes. together? So you, you are putting Control Alt Delete, and when you when you click when you type Control Alt Delete, in fact, you are sending a non-maskable interrupt for the CPU to tell the CPU that we need to uh, open the task manager. Okay, and then the task manager will close the program. You lose the task manager to close the program. Okay. So when an interrupt can be uh, mask, we say that this is a maskable interrupt, but if it's, it cannot be masked, okay, it, it should be treated by the CPU, on the time it arrives to the CPU, it's called a non-maskable interrupt. So that's all. This is a general introduction about the computer, the components of a uh, computer system. Now let's move to the uh, MARI architecture. So what is MARI? In fact, MARI stands for a machine architecture that is really intuitive and easy. So it's a machine architecture. This is a computer architecture, but it's very easy. And why we are using a very easy architecture? Because if you understand this simple architecture, believe me, you can understand any complicated, more complicated architecture. So here you have all that you need to know regarding computer systems. Okay, even complicated one, enter processes and so on. Okay, so we will try to uh, understand how a simple architecture works, how I can speak, okay, with a simple architecture, okay, that is Mari architecture. 
But before, let's define what does this architecture mean, okay? Or what are the characteristics of this architecture? So at first, Maria architecture, keep in mind, Maria architecture, this is a von Neumann model, so it contains a CPU with resistors, arithmetic logic unit, control unit, we have a memory and we have a way to communicate with input output devices, okay? But what are the characteristics of this architecture? At first, it uses two complement data representation to treat numbers. So since it uses two complement, so if I have a positive negative numbers, I will, already, I will represent them using two complement. So this architecture cannot deal with floating point system, for example. It can only understand signed integers, okay? But without fractions. Okay, it's a stored program fixed word length data and instructions. So this means that the program will be stored inside the memory, okay, dedicated memory. We have a fixed word length data and instructions. So length of data, data variables will always have the same number of bits. And same for the instructions, as I will explain later on. Memory in this architecture is a 4K times 16 word addressable main memory. Okay, so we have a small amount of memory for this architecture, 4K times 16. So what is the word length? What is the word length for this architecture, knowing that the memory is 4K times 16? Word length. This part gives you the word length. Okay? This part. So the word length is 16. Okay? Now how many locations do we have? So we need to calculate how many address, how many bits do we need to address one location? So what do we do? What do we do? We will use this formula again. So in fact, what we have is 4K, 4K, sorry, times 16. Okay, what we will do is to divide by the world length to know how many locations we have inside this memory. So we'll divide by 16, so we have 4K locations. So 4K is 2 power 2 times 2 power 10 locations, that is equal to 2 power 12 locations. So how many bits do we have to address one location? How, one, how many bits do we need to address one location? We need 12 bits. Okay? So locations will be, addresses will be 0, 1, 2, until we achieve the last address that is 2 power 12 minus 1. Okay? These are the addresses of the memory locations. The word length is the length of a register inside the CPU. Okay, data registers. Now, in this memory, in fact, we will store both. In any memory in a computer system, memory can store instructions for programs and uh, variables or data related to this program. Okay? So inside, inside this memory, we can find a location that contains an instruction for a program, or a part of this memory will be dedicated for the program, and another part for data. Okay? So one location can contain an instruction or it can contain a data, okay, generally speaking, okay? And since we have, this, this, since this is a word addressable memory, so each location contains how many bits? Eight bits. Oh, it's a word uh, addressable. No, I mean yeah, here, how many bits do we have? Knowing that this is a word addressable memory, If we have a byte addressable memory, we surely have 8 bits. But if we have a word addressable memory, we have a word, a word inside each location. So here, the word size is 16. So inside each location, I will have 16 bits. Okay? So now, since each location can store either a, and a data or an instruction, so instructions and data will have a length of 16 bits. Okay? This is
is why we have 16-bit instructions and even 16-bit for the arithmetic logic unit because data is 16 bits. Okay? I will explain how the instructions is divided later on. Inside my architecture, we have seven registers. So what are these registers? At first, we have the accumulator. Okay? We will explain in detail different architectures or different types of architecture that we might find in, uh, in the market. But you should know from now that MARI is an accumulator architecture. Why? Because we only has one uh, general purpose register. So we have only one register for data that is called the accumulator. Okay? That we can access as users. Okay? The accumulator is a register that stores data, and this is why it has a length of 16 bits. Okay. The memory address register, this is a special purpose register. So this is a memory address register, and so it's, it stores an address. And each address is 12 bits, as we've seen later on, as we've seen previously, sorry. So, how many addresses, do, how many bits do we have in this register? We have 12 bits, okay, to store only one address. So, what a memory address register, what is the job of a memory address register? Each time the CPU needs to write anything on the memory or read from the memory the address of the location inside which I want to write or from which I need to read, or the CPU needs to read, should be located inside the memory address register, okay? Now, the memory buffer register, same idea, but in this case, it's a uh, buffer register, so it stores data. So, each time I need to read from the memory, the data that I read from the memory will be stored by default in the memory buffer register first. Okay? Then if I want to write inside the main memory, the data should be in memory buffer register to be transferred to the, to the memory later on. Okay. Yes. While memory buffer register stores data. Okay, so this is why it's a 16-bit register. The program counter, we previously explained what is the program counter. So a program counter contains the address of the next instruction, so it is storing one address, so it has a length of 12 bits. Okay? The instruction register, when we explained uh, chapter 1, we said that we have an instruction register in the CPU. And what is an instruction register? It's a register that stores the instruction to be executed, okay, to be decoded and executed. So when the CPU, when the control unit fetches an instruction from the memory, it stores it inside the instruction register, okay? Now, what is the length of one instruction? 16 bits. So we need a 16-bit register for instructions, okay? Finally, input register and output registers. These are registered for output and have a length of 8-bit only, okay? Why? Because an input register formally only inputs from the keyboard, okay? It takes its input from the keyboard only. So what is I'm taking as input, or what the CPU is taking as input is only a character, an ASCII code. And an ASCII code is usually represented with 8 bits. Okay? So this is why input registers have only 8 bits. Okay? To store only one character. Okay? The same for output register. What I can output are only characters or numbers. Okay? Characters means number or letters or even uh, characters. So it's also an 8-bit register, and for Marie, the output is the monitor. Okay, it's always the monitor. So when I want to send something to the monitor, the CPU must store this data inside the output register. And if I, when I type something on the keyboard, this ASCII code will be stored inside the input register. Okay? First, okay, the first uh, step, I will first location inside which I will store in the input register and I will explain why I'm saying first, okay, when I explain how Marie works. 
So this is in general a general view of the Maria architecture with the different uh, resistor, the arithmetic logic unit and the control unit, how it's connected to the main memory and sure we have a connection with input output devices. Okay? And this is the addresses going from 0 to 4095 and 4095 is 2 power 12 minus 1. Okay? In Mari, so how these components, how these registers are connected, we surely use a bus. And a Mari uses a common bus scheme, that means that all these registers, all the registers are connected or use the same bus. So let me directly go to the uh, picture that shows the connections between registers. So we have a common bus scheme. For example, if I need to uh, take something from the main memory to the input register, so we are fetching an instruction. Okay, to the instruction register. I'm fetching the control unit is fetching something, an instruction from the memory. So the main memory sends the instruction, okay, to the instruction register. So it travels all this path, okay. Why, for example, if I want to read something from uh, main memory, okay, I need to write to read a data. It goes from main memory, okay, to achieve the memory buffer register by default, okay. So it travels a uh, longer path. Okay. And we, in addition to this bus, we have direct connections between uh, some registers. For example, accumulator is connected to memory buffer register, and memory buffer register and accumulator are directly connected to the arithmetic logic unit. Why? Because the arithmetic logic unit, when it adds, it needs two operands. When it adds or make arithmetic or logical operations, it needs two operands usually. One operand will be inside the accumulator, as we will see later on, and the second one will be in the memory buffer register. Okay? And in, uh, in addition, we have one direct connection between the memory address register and the main memory. Why? Because we said that memory address register contains the address of the location we want to access inside the memory. Okay, so we need to have a direct access to increase the speed of the architecture. Now, this is the architecture. So if we want to communicate as programmers, okay, as low-level programmers in this case, we need, or you need to fix in mind what is the architecture you are dealing with. Unlike when you are a high-level language programmer, so if you are using Java or you are using C++ or C Sharp or any high-level language programming, you don't need to, need to know what is the architecture you are dealing with. You don't need to know what is the computer or the speed of the computer of the architecture of the computer you are dealing with. Why? Because you are writing with a, in a high-level language. You will use a compiler that makes the, the uh, conversion from high-level language to assembly language. But when we are using, when we are writing a program in assembly language, we should, we must keep in mind, or we must know what is the architecture we are dealing with, because we will directly communicate with the registers inside the CPU. Okay? So, language that explains to us how we can communicate with the uh, architecture is combined or is listed in what is called instruction set architecture. Okay? So an instruction set architecture, or RSA, is a kind of interface because be between a computer's hardware and its software and typically the user that or the programmer that is writing or building this software. Okay? So it contains different instructions to be used to execute the program. For Mari, now what is the instruction set architecture for Mari? We have in fact for Mari, we've said that an instruction is a 16-bit instruction. So to represent an instruction, we have 16 bits. And this instruction will be stored inside the main memory in one location. This instruction is divided into two main parts. The first part is called the opcode, and the second part is dedicated for the address of the opcode. Okay? In fact, the opcode will define what is the type of the instruction. Okay? So when, basically, when the CPU decodes an instruction, it will read the opcode. Okay? And same you will do if you want to decode what is the instruction. And we'll take an example of it. So how many bits do we have for the opcode? We have four bits, okay? The four most significant bits on the left. 
Faisan, since we have four bits, each of code is one instruction. So how many instructions we can have? How many different instructions we can have for Marie? Not only four bits. No. We have four bits for the opcode. What does this mean? That we start from 0000, zero, zero, zero to achieve 1111. One, one, one. And each code, each opcode means a different instruction. So how many, how with the total number of instructions we can represent using an opcode with four bits only? 16. So 2 power 4. Okay? So going from 0 to 15. Okay? So what we will do is to list all the opcodes, okay, and give the definition of the, uh, what does uh, the binary representation means in the instruction set. And then we will have an address, an address uh, field that contains 12 bits. Why? Because an address is really, is inside the, inside Marie we have an address of 12 bits, okay? So 12 plus 4 will make 16, that is the word, uh, that is the instruction length. So the uh, first nine instructions that we will learn today are load, store, add, subtract, input, output, halt, skip, count, and jump. Okay? So we can see in this uh, table that we have a binary number, its hexadecimal representation, and the instruction uh, corresponding to this binary number. And what is this binary number? It's the opcode. Okay? So if I have an instruction with the first four most significant bits equal to 0001, this means that this instruction is a load instruction. Okay? And what does this mean? What is a load instruction? A load instruction will read the content inside address X and store it in the, in the accumulator. Okay? This is the job of load. When the CPU fetches and executes load X, it goes to address X in memory, fetches the, the uh, content, or takes the content, and store it in the accumulator. So load X is usually used to read a data, okay, from memory. I need to emphasize here on one uh, main point, okay? I previously said that when we take a data from the main memory, it is firstly stored in the memory buffer register, okay? In fact, it's firstly, register, it is firstly stored in the memory buffer register, but when we use, when, we, when the CPU is executing a load X, after storing it in the memory buffer register, it will make a copy and store it inside the accumulator, okay? So this is a two-step, and this will be discussed next time, okay? When we discuss the register transfer language. So, this is load X instruction. Now, when we see 0010 for the opcode, this means that this is store X instruction. And store X means that we are storing at address X what is included in the accumulator. Okay? Keep in mind the accumulator contains only data. Okay? So we are storing a data word at address X. So what we have in the accumulator will be stored at address X. Add X. So, add X, it adds, but here we need two operands, okay? The first operand will be in the accumulator, and the second operand is at address X, is the content of address X. So, when executing this uh, instruction, the CPU adds the content of the accumulator to the content of address X, add them, and store the result inside the accumulator. So, it replaces the content of the accumulator by the sum of the accumulator plus the content of memory x. Okay? Subtraction, same idea, like add, but instead of adding, adding we are subtracting. Okay? And what we are subtracting is the, uh, the content of address x will be subtracted from ac. This means that we are calculating ac minus the content of address x. Okay? And not the inverse. Okay? This is an important note, okay, to avoid mistakes. 
Now input and output. Input, it takes one input, okay, and store it inside the accumulator, okay? So will input be taken from the keyboard, okay? And you have a question in the TMA regarding how you need to read from the uh, keyboard. Okay, so you obviously use input. The output instruction is to output something on the screen. We will use the output. So what we will have, what we have inside the accumulator will be shown on the screen, okay? The halt instruction terminate the program. So it's the final instruction in any program you will find halt, okay? The skip count, I will explain it in details later on. I will move to jump X. The jump X replaces the content of the PC with X. What does this mean? Let me explain on the uh, memory picture. For example, I have a program stored at address 2 inside the memory of my loop. Okay? A three line instruction, a three line code. So that contains only three instructions. Okay? And one of these instructions is say Okay, I'm not using the correct syntax now just to explain to you what is the job of uh, job instruction. So my program contains one first instruction, then a jump instruction, then a third instruction, okay? So at first when we are executing the program, we'll execute the first instruction, then we'll go to the next one, fetch the code, execute the next one, and so on, okay? Now, when the computer system, when the CPU achieves this instruction, it will read jump seven. So inside the CPU, by default, the PC, when, he, when, it, when the CPU achieves instruction number 3 and is executing it, the PC by default contains the next address, okay, the address of the next instruction. That is, in this case, 4, next instruction. When executing this instruction, the PC contains the address of the next instruction. Now, when it executes this instruction, it's, it will replace the content of the PC with the new address that is 7. Okay? Now, next step is to make a fetch to code execute and to fetch the control unit to read the content of the PC. So it will find 7. So instead of going to instruction number 3 in the program, it jumps to, is to address number 7. So it reads this instruction. Okay? And by default, when it jumps, okay, when it Jumping by default, it will be the PC will contain 8 again because it's executing now this instruction, this new example instruction. And this instruction, it will read really that we have jump 4. So the PC will be re replaced by 4. Okay? And after finishing execution, the CPU control unit reads the content of PC that is 4, goes to 4 and fetches. was 4, then 8. 4, then 7. Here, the PC will be 4. Yes. When we are executing this instruction. After executing the instruction, 4 will be replaced by 7. Okay. okay? Now, at the end of this instruction, we will need to make a new fetch decode execute. Okay. So, during the fetch cycle, the C control unit is 7. Okay, so it goes to address 7 and fetch this instruction to execute it. Okay, now when it reads, it will directly change 7 to 8. PC is incremented by 1. Okay, it's automatic, it's automatic. Okay, when fetching, the PC will be incremented by 1. Now, after executing this one, okay, at the end, 
the PC that says it's a jumping start. It could be another thing. But here I take an, I took this example to show you how a jump works. So I say to jump, but it could be anything else, add or something. Okay? So in this case, it's a jump instruction, so A will be replaced, re-replaced by 4. Okay, and even 4 can be another thing, it could be 2, for example. Okay? But here I took 4, okay, to continue the program. And if it's 2, uh... When it's, whatever. If it's 4 or 5 or 2, what the CPU, what the controller will do, it reads the content of PC and goes to this address to fetch. So if we have 4, so it reads 4, it goes to address 4 and executes the instruction. If it's 2, the control unit reads 2, so it goes to this then instruction it's not and executes. Error? It's not giving an error? No, no, no. It doesn't give an error because we have an instruction in the next. At different places. In fact, the job is typically used to create a if statement to create, uh, I will not an if statement, let's say, a while loop or a full loop, okay, you achieve the end and you need to go back. How you go back by a jump using a jump instruction. Now the famous skip count instruction. So skip count is will be typically used to uh, represent an if, okay, in high level language. But before let's take an, a simple example. So here we have this is a machine instruction. Okay, machine language. When you read a, an instruction in binary, this is a machine instruction. Okay? So this is an instruction in binary. The first four bits will be for the opcode, and the last 12 bits is the address part. Okay? And they need us to read, to know what is the job of this machine instruction. So we need, we'll read the first four bits, that is 0001. Okay? So 0001 is load. Okay, so the job of this instruction, the job of this instruction is to load what we have at, at this address that is in decimal 3, okay, and store the result in the accumulator. Okay? You don't need to memorize this table, okay? If you, if you, if you will be asked about uh, to decode a machine instruction, they will give you this table. The idea is to understand and not to memorize. Now skip count. So as I explained, or ever, as I mentioned previously, skip count is used to uh, make an if instruction. Or if instruction, if I use a compiler, will be replaced by a skip count. If surely if we are using an if instruction. So what is a skip count? So it is a skipping instruction, but under a condition. Okay? So skip count will skip the next instruction if a uh, Boolean test is true. Okay? So in fact, skip count contains two parts, like any other like any other instruction. We have the opcode and the address. So we will have skip count and here we will have a value. That is typically 12 bits. Now this value is not an address in this case. This is not an address for a memory location. But it is instead the it defines the test. Okay, the Boolean test. If it's equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 base 16, so that is 12 bits, 12 zeros. This means that it tests, skip count tests if the accumulator is negative. Okay, the logical test if the accumulator is negative. Now, if it's equal, this value in hexadecimal is equal to 4, 0, 0 in hexadecimal, that is 0, 1, 0, 0, 4 in 4 bits in hexadecimal is 0, 1, 0, 0, then we have 4 zeros and 4 zeros. Okay? If this is 400, the logical test if the accumulator is equal 
zero. Okay? And if this uh, value is equal to 800, that is 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 8 zeros, the test will be if the accumulator is positive. Okay? Now, if the computer system reads is executing, for example, a skip count, If the accumulator is negative, the next instruction in the program will be skipped. What does this mean? Okay, typically in the, in the, uh, in the, in the central process unit, the, when the accumulator is negative, it is negative, so the test is true, the PC will be incremented by one. Okay, to, to skip the next instruction. Okay? If not, if the PC will be kept intact. So we will continue the execution. What does this mean? For example, if we have a skip count, then a jump address, I don't know, let's say 12 is the decimal, and then we have add, just add any, anything. So if the accumulator is negative, when we need a program, we are executing a program, if the accumulator is negative, I will not execute this instruction, I will execute this one, and then I will continue. But if it's not negative, we will jump to this address. Okay? So this is the skip count. Now, if the accumulator, if I want to change the, uh, the test, the logical test, all that I need to do is to change the value of the address. Okay? Now, why I use 000, 400, 800? Why on the slides you can see that we have only two bits. In fact, the computer system doesn't check the uh, totality of the 12 bits. It only checks only two bits to determine the logical test. It tests the first two bits that, is, that are called B11, B10. Okay? Since B12, B13, B14, and B15 is for the old code. Okay? You understand what I mean? And then the value will be from B11 to B0. So in fact, the, when decoding the instruction, the CPU only reads the first two bits of the address code. If it's 0, 0, then the test will be if accumulator is negative. If it's 0, 1, okay, if the accumulator is 0, and if it's 1, 0, then it tests if the accumulator is positive. This is the computer system. But when you are writing a program, okay, as programmers, you need to write these to use this notation. So skip count and 12 bits in binary and only three digits in the list. And by default, when you are writing a program for Marie, as I will explain it now, the um, values are not expressed in binary by default, you need to express them in the list. Okay, this is easier for you. I will, I will take an example, I will explain an example on how to use skip code, okay? So consider the following binary instruction, so same instruction, but we, so, so same question, but we have a different instruction. So starting with 1000 and then a code, okay, in address part. So when we need 100, going back to, this, to the table, you will find that 1000 is a skip count. And then since the address part starts with 10, so we are testing if the accumulator is positive, okay, one zero. I explained that. I will not, I will skip the register transfer notation. This will be explained next week, okay, to gain time and to cover everything included in the TME. So I will directly go to explain a simple program. So how we can write a simple program in Mali. So before knowing how we can write a program, we need to understand how we can 
understand or read and program them. Okay? So this is a program stored in the, in the main memory of the uh, Amari architecture. So we, we, uh, we read load 104, add 105, store 106 half, okay, and then values. What we have here is a table that shows us the program and the address of each instruction. So in this case, we compile, we assume that we assemble the program. Okay, we use an assembler to convert our program from assembly language to machine language. And this machine language is stored, this program is already stored inside the main memory. Okay? In fact, what you will do when you write a, an assembly program, you will write it using a software that is called Marie Simulator, and then you will assemble it okay, to create the binary uh, machine language codes. And each instruction will be stored inside the main memory at an address, starting by an address that you will define, and I will explain how. Okay? So in fact, each instruction of your program will be stored on an address inside the memory. Okay? And this is what we previously explained. All programs are stored inside the main memory of the computer. So this is the machine language of load 104. And this is the assembly representation of this the first instruction. And here, this is the hexadecimal representation of the, this binary. OK, so it's four bits converted to decimal. Now, what is the job of this program? So we read the first instruction. What you will do is read the first instruction, then execute it, next one, execute it, and so on. Okay? As a programmer, okay, when you want to, when you need to analyze a program, you need to identify what is the content of the accumulator. Because what you what interests you as programmer is the content of the accumulator. You are using Maria architecture. So when we read load 104, what is the job of load instruction? No, loads, it takes the data from the main memory, okay? From which address specified in the address part, okay? So keep in mind, this is the memory, and these are the data, the instruction stored, what we have inside the memory, okay? So when the CPU decodes load 104, see that this is a load instruction, so it goes to address 104, so it goes to address 104 inside the main memory, Take the value inside and store it in the accumulator. Okay? So we have here what we have, what we will have. I will rewrite the program on the board. And add one five. And I will represent here the content of the accumulator after the execution of an instruction. So, load 104, the CPU goes to address 104, not the CPU, but it, the CPU reads what we have inside 104 and stores the content of this location, of this address in the accumulator. So, what we will have here is 0, 0, 23, so and this is the hexadecimal number, okay, by default. So after executing the load of four, the accumulator con contains this value. Now, when the CPU terminates, executing this uh, instruction, it goes to the next one. It fetches the next one, it goes and executes it. So we need to execute this instruction. So add 105. So when we are adding, we will add the content of the accumulator, what we have in the accumulator, to the value and address 105. So what we will add is the content of 105, that is FFE9, to what we have inside the accumulator. So what we have in the new, and then the result will be stored inside the accumulator. So the new value of the accumulator, after executing this instruction, will be the old value in hexadecimal 
بلس اف اف اوكي طبعا دي دي اريثمتيك لوجيك يونت ويل دو دي كالكوليشن اند ويل ستور دي ريزلت ان ذا اكونت اوكي طبعا كيب ان مايند ذيز ار باينري نمبرز اند كومبلمنت اجين ذا ماري اركيتكتشر يوزز كومبلمنت تو سيستم تو بريزنت نمبرز سو ذيس از وي كان ريديو ذات ذيس از ا نيجاتيف نمبر اوكي بيكوز ات ستارت ويز 1 اف از 1 1 1 1 اوكي Then it is stored. Next instruction is to store at address 106. So what we will have, what we have inside the accumulator, will be stored at address 106 after executing this instruction. So after executing this instruction, the content of the accumulator will be the same. In fact, what we will store is a copy of what we have inside the accumulator. So here we will have the same result. Okay, but at address 106 after executing store 106. Here we will have When finished, when it finished, uh, it executes hard, that can be a new program. So here, the accumulator, the uh, content of the accumulator is the same, but the uh, system can be a new program. So the program is ended. So it's clear? Yes. Great. Now, in fact, before explaining how we can write a program, I need you to know that Instead of using addresses, because when we are writing a program, it's difficult to find the addresses of our variables. Okay? So instead of using numbers, we can use labels. Okay? So, in fact, this program can be written like that. So we will start with the uh, or instruction I will explain. Then we can write load x. Add y because these are two different addresses and then store z and terminate with a hub. So now we are writing our program, but instead of using one or four, one or five, we are using labels. Okay, x, y, and z. Okay, and how to define the value of these addresses? After you finish your program, after the hub, okay, you will define your values. You will say that. At this address, x, okay, at the address of this line, we will store, for example, 0, 0, 23. Then y will be f, f, e, 9. And we'll put a default value for z, for example, 0, 0, 0. Okay? Y four digits, because we have 16. And y in address is only three hexadecimal digits because we have 12. 12, 3 times 4 is equal to 12. So it is clear, labels, how to use labels. So furthermore, we can uh, avoid using hexadecimal numbers. We can use decimal representation. So we can say that instead of writing 0, 0, 23, we can say, we can use what is called a directive. We can say that this is a decimal number and equal to 35. Okay? So instead of writing an hexadecimal number, by default we need to write an hexadecimal number. But instead of writing an hexadecimal number, you can write, you can say that this is what I'm writing here is a decimal number by using what is called a diagram. Okay? So this is to say that the following number is a decimal. Okay? So now, I will take an example to explain how we can use skip count instruction. Does anyone uh, can give a, an idea 
what could be the uh, what what is the job of formal analysis? Because when we executed the program, we didn't mention anything about formal analysis. Because in fact, when executing the program, when executing the program, all 100 will not be uh, in our memory. In fact, when we use, when you use marine simulator, okay, to write a program, you need to specify the address of the first instruction. So where you want to store this program. So you will use an old instruction. So when the computer system assembles your program, okay. It reads as all 100 and directly store the uh, yes, start the execution from one. Okay. So inside the memory, this will be stored at address 100, 101, 102, and so on. Okay. Now let's suppose that we want a program that has two numbers. Okay, so we need to write a program that adds two variables, x plus, I mean, two variables that are stored at two different addresses, x and y. And if there is a, I should say, n of x, n of y, to say that the content of address x is added to the content of address y, so we we'll say n of x and n of y, to say this is the content of address x. Okay? If the result is positive, we, out, we will output the result and terminate the program. If not, we will only terminate the program. Okay? So how we can write this program? I will directly write it on the Mari simulator. Okay, to show you how to use Mari simulator and how to build a program. So in fact, when you uh, access the DNS, you will find a link. You can download, you can click on this link and download the Mari Simulator. Okay? In the Mari Simulator, you will have a file that is called Mari Sim. You double click on this file. Without this file, you have any installation. You double click on this file, and this window you will have this window. Okay? Now, to write your program, okay, you need to make five edits. Okay? To create a program. So here you can write our program. So we will always start by an OR instruction. So we have a choice. We can start from all zeros to all ones. Okay, so starting from uh, zero, 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 or we can start from FFF, but we cannot start from FFF. We have more than one instruction. Okay? So we'll start, for example, at address 200. Okay? Now, what do we, now what do we need to do? Okay? We need to add two numbers. But before adding these numbers, we need to load them inside the CPU. Right? So, how do we read something from the memory? Okay? We will use a load. Everyone say that the address of the first component is x. So after executing this instruction, what we will have in the accumulator is the content of address x. Okay, so this is our first operand. So then, what we will do? What do you think we need? Which aspect? Why we need to load? Now, 
if we write log y, if we write log y, when this... So, let me explain. If we write log y, what will happen after the execution? The accumulator will change to y. Yes. So, the content of the accumulator changes. Okay? What we have in the accumulator will be replaced by the content of y. So, we cannot, in fact, in an accumulator architecture such as Marie, we cannot load two variables. We can only load one variable and store it in the accumulator. Now, each time we need to make an arithmetic operation, we will load the first variable and then we will add, subtract. We will add or subtract. Okay? So, for example, if we have x plus y plus z, we need to calculate the addition of three variables. We need to load x, add y, and then add z. Okay? So we will add the first two, then we will add to the sum the third value. Okay? So keep in mind we can only load the accumulator one value. So should, should, should we use load y here or replace it with another instruction? So we will replace it with an add y instruction. So I'll repeat. After executing global x, we will have the content of that as x stored in the accumulator. Then, after executing y, add y, what we have in the accumulator will be added to the content of that as y, and the result will be stored in the accumulator. So, after executing this instruction, what we will have inside the accumulator is the content of that as x plus the content of that as y, so we calculate the sum. Okay? Now, what do we need to do? We need to make the test now. Why? Because the accumulator already contains the sum of x plus y, or the content of x plus the content of y. So we need to make the test. And what is the test? We will use a skip count. This is true. But shall we skip the next condition if the Content of the accumulator is positive, negative, or equal to zero. In an if else instruction, in an if else uh, condition, we have some instructions that will be executed if the test is true. Okay? So I'm here, I, I'm going back to higher language. So if I have a condition, if the test is true, we will execute what we will have inside the if. Okay? If the test is true. But if the test is not true, I will skip all these instructions and go to this instruction, that is after else. Okay? So when I will jump, when we will jump, 
when it's not true. Okay? So in fact, when our life here jump, and I will say that this is else, and I will write If the test is true, I will not jump and I will continue the execution of the program. So what I will have here, what I will write here, are the instructions if the test is true. Is true. According to my question, it's how not I, mentioned, it's I not I saying that uh, what is the front of x1. When you are writing your program, you need to keep in mind that x and y can take any value. And you need to rebuild your program on that, based on that. So here I don't know what is the front of x and y. But I know that if x plus y is positive, I need to do things. And if it's not, I need to do other things. This is what I know. And you can take default values, you can take any default values, you can take 0, 0, for example, as you like. But when you are writing your program, you, you should not consider what is the constant of x and y. Whatever is the constant of x and y, what is the program that creates this if else some is true? Okay? Now let me go back here. So, if the test is true, I will not jump to else. Okay? So if the test is true, I will not jump to else, and hence I will skip this jump to. Okay? So when the test is true, I will not jump to else. And I will directly execute the next instance, not this one, the one after. Okay? So what we will have after the next instruction, after jump else, so we have skipped on, an instruction, and then another instruction. What we have here is the uh, instructions to be executed if the test is true. Okay, we can express that as then, for example. So keep in mind then, if, and else, as I define x and y, are only notations, are only labels, to say that this address is the address of if. The address of this instruction, I mentioned the address of this instruction is the then, it is the result of then, it's called then. It's just labels to clarify your problem, but you can uh, remove that. Okay? So what we will have here is the instructions to be executed if the test is true. And then you will have else to execute the instructions if the result is false. Okay? Now perhaps you need to make a jump here, okay, to skip what is uh, the, the, the else's instruction. Okay, so we have else's instruction. After we end the execution of these instructions, we need to skip what we have after else. Okay, so we need to make a jump. Okay, but in this program we will not do the jump at the end, and I will explain that. It's clear now the jump, okay, how to implement and end using skip count. Instead of jumping in, in here, in both cases, we are jumping to a higher yeah. address. Yeah, because we jump after the skip command, okay? Okay. The, the condition is true and we jump. We skip. We skip and we don't have the end of the program. We have only the condition. So the program continues if you don't have a jump. And if I replace the else of the jump, then it Let me say that here I have a jump. Where the where is the end? Where do you want to put the end? Here? Yeah. I will in put case the jump, in case the condition I have in the depth is not true, it will end. Here I don't have skip count. No, I'm telling you. That's why I said. Let me say that I will write after the end, jump end. Okay, after this one. 
So if the skill if the accumulator is true, if the accumulator is positive, I'll skip this one, execute what I need to do if the test is true. And at the end, I don't want to execute what I have next, because by default the program uh, executes sequential instructions. I don't want to execute this one. I will jump to this address and I will find how. The, term, the program will terminate. If I want to create a while loop, okay, I need to jump to a previous address. Okay? So I can drive jump, for example, if. If I have to go back to the end. If you want to go back. And I have to jump before the end. Yeah. To create a while loop, but this is not if. So let me now apply this skip command in our exercise. So since we want to make an if statement, usually 99% of the uh, examples we will have a jump after skip command. So jump to, let's say, to what I will uh, consider as These are only layers, okay? I can run the program without these layers. I will show you. Okay? Then jump test. After this instruction, we will write what we need to do if the test is true. Okay? So if the test is true, we need to output the result and then terminate the program. Okay? So I will say that I will output to output the result and instruction that outputs what I have in the accumulator is output. Okay? Then I will terminate the program. Okay? Now let's check if what we written is true, if what we wrote is true. So we will load x, add y, so at this stage after executing this instruction in what we will have inside the accumulator x plus y, so m x plus m y. If the test is true, so if the accumulator is positive, so x plus y is positive, we will skip jump s, so this will not be executed, and we will execute output and then how. Okay, so we we'll output the result and then make the program. So this is correct. But what happens if the uh, test is false? So if x plus y is not positive, so it's equal zero or negative. In this case, we need to jump to else, so we have to define what is the else, okay? So surely you can write else here, as I previously explained. You can write else, okay, this is true, and then write the instruction that we need to execute when the test is not true, but I don't need only to terminate the program, so I can write here out, okay? So then I, I can write my values. So x is, um, let's say it's equal to 5 in decimal. And y is equal, let's say, in decimal 10. Okay? Now, this is a correct, if this is a correct program, okay? I hope so, to check after we assemble. Okay? Uh, but I have the comment. Here we have a repeated instruction. A half instruction is repeated. So in fact, instead of making the else here, I can write the else here. Okay? Let me show you what happens. Now, if the test is positive, if accumulator is positive, I will jump and execute output and half and then terminate my program will be terminated. Now, if the test is not true, so the accumulator, the content of the accumulator is negative or equal to zero, we will execute this instruction, so we will move here, as out. But what if I remove this one, so we terminate the program without outputting, and this is what we need to do, okay? But what if I remove this instruction and write my hands here? So I will jump to this instruction. Since I want to execute a half if the result is negative, so I will put my S here, okay, to reduce the size of my program, that's all. Okay, and both will give the same topic, a correct answer. Any question? So I will show you now how we can save and assemble our program and then execute it. So 
So I will save my program. Okay, you need to select that this is a mass file. So my assembly file. So let's save it to a test file. I will save it. So after saving, you need to assemble. So convert to machine language. So it will reflect assemble, assemble coming file. If no mistakes, it says that assembly successful. Okay? If we have a mistake, for example, it shows us where are we mistake. So it's here. So I can do that I made a mistake here. Okay? So here the address of the open cannot be identified. Okay? So after assembly, we will load our program. So we need to load. What do you load the max file? Okay? I will just one minute and I'll end. So you load your program and then you can run. Done. Okay? So what happened here? Since x plus y are positive, okay? So the result is positive. Today we will uh, continue to cover what we didn't cover last time. So I remind you that uh, I explained Marie, what is the instruction set architecture for Marie, and then we directly move to how to write a simple program, okay, using Marie and Marie Simulator. Okay. And uh, I told you that when you are writing a program, all that you need to focus on is the content of a register called the accumulator, okay? Because why? Because all instructions uses, uh, use the uh, accumulator. If you want to load, we'll load from memory and store in the accumulator. If you want to store, we'll store from the accumulator to the memory, okay? Today, we will see what happened inside Marie architecture. So inside the computer, inside the CPU, what happens to the registers inside the CPU. Not only the accumulator, but what happens to all registers, okay? So we will start with register transfer notation. What is register transfer notation? This is the language of registers inside the CPU. So I repeat, not only the accumulator, but all registers inside the CPU. For example, when we explained the re registers inside Marie, we said that we have a register called uh, MAR, okay, Memory Address Register, and MBR. And we said that each time we want to read something from memory or write something from memory, we should specify the address. 
And where to store this address? Inside the memory address register, okay? When we want to write data inside the memory, this data need to be written inside a register called memory buffer register, okay? While when we use store X, okay, we directly th thought that we will store what we have in the accumulator inside the memory at address X. But what really happens is different. This is explained by the register transfer notation or register transfer language. So what is the RTL or what is the language of register? So what we are we will trying to do, what we will try to do is to take each instruction we previously studied and try to uh, develop it Okay, to see what happens inside the registers. Before, uh, this is some notes, okay? MX, you already seen that in the TMA, okay? That means that this is the content of address X inside the memory, okay? So this is the data stored at address X, okay? It could be data or instruction, okay? And this is to say that what we have on the right will be stored on the left, okay? So let's start with load x. So I remind you, load x reads data at address x and store it in the accumulator. Okay? This is the big title of load, but what happens inside the CPU? In fact, each time we load, we need to load something, this address x will be stored inside the memory address register. Why? Because we want to access something inside the memory. So we must specify its address inside the memory address register, okay? So x will be stored in the memory address register. Then what we read from this address, so what we read, the content inside the memory at address MAR, which contains x in this case, will be stored in the MBR, in the memory buffer register, before being stored inside the accumulator, okay? So in fact, what we've seen previously is only the last uh, step that we have in memory is stored in the accumulator. And this is what really happens. Okay? But there are several steps before. Is it clear? Right. Store X, same idea. I need to store something inside the memory. Okay? So I need to put the address in the memory address register. So I put X in the memory address register. And what I need to store inside the memory should be stored inside the MDR. Okay, so everything I want to store inside the memory should be in MDR. So I will put the accumulator inside memory buffer register, and then what I have in the memory buffer register will be stored at address MDR. Okay? Clear? Add X, add, we know that add X, add the content of the accumulator to what I have inside the address X. Okay? So I need to get what I have at address X, so I'll put X in the MAR, what I have at this address will be stored in the MBR, and then the addition will be done between the MBR and what I have in the accumulator. Okay, this is the job of the arithmetic logic unit. Okay, so each time I want to send something to the monitor, I need to put it inside the output register. HAL has no specific RTL because it terminates the program. So nothing is changed inside the registers. And jump x, we jump to address x. So next instruction to be fetched is stored at x. So what specifies the address of the next instruction? The program counter. Okay, by default, PC content, meaning contains the address of the next instruction. So in, to when I write jump x, I will replace the content of the PC by x. Okay, the address to which I need to jump. Okay. It terminates the program. This is the last instruction in your program. No. It doesn't change anything in the registers. Now I'll skip come. Okay? I remind you, it seems complicated, but it is not. Okay? Because you know how it works, skip come. So I remind you that you have three types of skip come. Skip come all zero, 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 zero in hexadecimal, skip count 400 or skip count 800, okay? 
And what changes between an address part and another is only the first two bits in the address part. Here we call them B11, B10. Okay? So, these values specifies the test to be done. And based on the result of the test, we will skip the next instruction or not. Okay? So what you have here is an if-else statement. So if bit 11, bit 10 are equal 0, 0, what is the test? Accumulator is negative. Okay? So the test to make is if accumulator is negative. If this is true, we should skip the next instruction. What does this mean? The current value of PC is the address of the next instruction. So if I add one to the PC, I will skip none instruction. Okay? So if the test is true, we will increment PC by 1. Okay? This is if bit 11, bit 10 are equal 0, 0. Now, if these are not equal 0, 0 and are equal 0, 1, so this is 400. In this case, you are testing if the accumulator is equal 0. So if, if, if it is equal 0, then you will increment. You will skip next instruction. Okay? Else you will do nothing. Okay? There is no else. Okay, the only else is to test if you have another test. Okay? But if it's 0, 1 and the accumulator is not equal 0, then we will not increment PC by 1. That is what I wanted to say. Now, if it's not equal 0, 0, first 11 bit, 11 bit, 10, not equal 0, 1, and R equal to 1, 0, in this case, the test is if the accumulator is positive. And if it is positive, I will increment the PC by 1 to skip the next instruction. Okay. Now, a note is that here we are using IR1110. We are not using B11, B10, as we've done previously. Why? What does IR mean? It's a register. But what, what, what is this register, IR? Does it remind you with anything? IR, we, we gave this abbreviation. This is the instruction register. Okay, so the register that stores the instruction that is being decoded and executed now. Okay, so when you fetch your, we will explain that, but when you fetch your uh, instruction from the memory, it will be stored directly inside the instruction register. So if we have a load, load or add, Okay, load x inside the memory. I have fetched this instruction. Load x in binary. The binary version of load x will be stored inside the instruction register. So instruction register bits number uh, uh, 15 to 12 contains the opcode. Okay, and the last part of the instruction register from bit 11, bit 10 to uh, bit 11 to bit 0 contains the address part. Okay always. Your instruction is stored inside the instruction register. So if you want to access a part of this instruction, you will take it from the instruction register. And this is why we wrote here instruction register bit 11, bit 10. Okay? Furthermore, to better understand, even when you write the jump x, we are loading x into PC. What really happens, the CPU doesn't know what is x how it accesses X from the instruction register. So the instruction register contains a jump, the opcode of jump, then the address 12 bits, that is X. So what will be stored in the PC is in fact IR bit number 11 to 0. Okay? So bit number 11 to 0 inside the instruction register. So in all these languages, all these RTL for each uh, instruction, you can replace X with IR with IR 11 to 0. Okay, which are 12 bits related to the address part. And this is written, this is explained. Is it clear? Now, 
more than that, not only what is changing inside the registers when we are executing a instruction, an instruction. We will see now how we fetch, and starting from the fetch process until the executions, what the execution of the instruction, what happens inside the CPU. <coughs> so this is an algorithm to show you what really happens. So in all computer systems, we always have a fetch, decode, execute cycle, as we've seen in chapter one, okay? Each fetch, decode, execute cycle is only for one instruction, okay? During the fetch, what is the main idea? Is to take the instruction and store it uh, in the CPU, to be there, to be later decoded and executed, okay? So in Mari, what happens? So what we will do, we need to go to the memory to take the instruction, okay? So what is the address of the instruction? It is stored inside the PC, okay? I will make a drawing on the board to show you what really happens. So this is the CPU, which contains the PC, the IR, instruction register, on the ARU, the accumulator, and we have the control unit, we have the MAR, we have the MDR. So there are input output registers, I'm not showing you. Okay? And we have the memory that contains our program. Let's say a program that uh, loads two numbers and add them. Okay, only we have two numbers and add them. So load x, add y, and y. Okay, only else, without doing anything else. So during the fetch, Okay, now, the PC by default, when you write OR 100, the PC contains 100, okay? That is the address of the first instruction. Come on, this is hexadecimal. We really have 12 bits, okay? 3 times 4, which is the address of this instruction. Then we have 101, 102. So during the fetch, what happens? We need to access the memory. So we need that this address, contains the address of the next instruction. So this address will be stored in the memory address register. Why? Because we need to go to this address. So we will store what we have in the PC inside the memory address register. Okay? Then, this is the first block. Copy the PC to MAR. Then we will copy the content of the memory address MAR to the instruction register. So we access the, the, the CPU, accesses the memory, takes a copy of the instruction and store it directly in this case in the instruction register, in the IR. Okay? Why? Because it's a fetch. Okay? During a decode, it is stored in the MDR, but during the fetch, the instruction is directly stored in the instruction register. So here we have load X. Okay? Finished? Finished? No. Not yet because we need to prepare the address of the next instruction for the next fetch decode execute cycle. So we will increment the PC by one, okay? So the PC here contains the address now of the next instruction, okay? For the next cycle. So then this is done, now we've, we've done with the fetch uh, step. We need now to decode, okay? So in fact, how can this control unit decode the instruction? How it can know which, what is the instruction? It reads the first four bits. Here it's not a, an assembly instruction. It's written in machine language. So here we have four bits of code and 12 bits for the address. Okay? But for simplicity reasons, I'm writing it in assembly. So the control unit knows that this is a load from the opcode. Okay, during the decode process. It automatically uh, stores X, the address part, in the MAR. 
Why? Because most probably we need to get an operand from the memory. Okay, at other states. So here we will have x. So this is the third block. So decoding instruction uh, and place bits instruction register 110 in memory MAR. So what we have here will be stored in the MAR, which is the address of the operand. Okay? Now, the test is instruction requires operand. Taban when the controller knows that this is a low instruction, it knows that it needs to go to memory to get an operand. Okay? Faizan, in this case, the answer is yes. So it goes to address x, okay, and take the operand from the address x, which is somewhere here, and contains a value. Let's say uh, 0 to 3, make the best. <coughs> so this value will be stored in the MDR, okay, because this is the low, okay. This is the decode process. Okay, we prepare the operand, we decoded the instruction, then we prepare the operand. It's now ready, it's in the MBR. Okay? Now during the execution, we will execute the instruction. So what is the execution of a load instruction? Is to store what we get from the what, what we got from the memory inside the accumulator. So this value will be stored inside the accumulator. Okay? And we This is the end. So after being executed, or in this case only copy what we have in the MBR in the accumulator, we go to the next fetch decode execute. So the control unit reads what we have in the PC, store it in the MAR, goes to this address, store it in the instruction register. So we will have add one in this case. Okay? So this is the fetch decode execute. Now what happens if we have an interrupt? Okay? I remind you that an interrupt is a uh, signal that interrupts the execution of a kernel program. So now we have load x, add y, and ho. But before executing add y, okay, the mouse send us, sent us an interrupt. Okay? Someone moved the mouse. So the CPU needs to process the, uh, the function related to moving the pointer on the screen. Okay, so it needs to execute another program. Okay, so how this is doing, in fact, before starting a new fetch decode execute, at this point, each time the CPU will check what is called a status register. Okay, a register that contains uh, bits. Okay a given one. And each bit is a flag. Okay? Alam. So when a flag is raised, yo, this means that I have an interrupt from somewhere. Because I have a flag for the mouse, a flag for the uh, keyboard, a flag for other things, and so on. Okay? So when any flag is raised, the CPU detects it. Okay? So based on the priority of the interrupt, it executes the interrupt function, okay? Then it goes back or to continue the previous program or to handle another interrupt, okay? Perhaps we will still, we are still having an interrupt, okay? So before continuing the program, we need to handle another interrupt, okay? So before starting each fetch decode execute cycle, the CPU checks if there is an interrupt. If there is an interrupt, Okay, it's, uh, need, this is added at the first point, after the start, okay? So if we have an interrupt, the CPU processes the interrupt, and then go back to check again if there is an interrupt. If no, it goes back to the previous program, okay? Now I remind you that each time we need to go back to the previous program, we need to get what we had inside the register which are stored inside the memory before handling the interrupt, okay? Is it clear? Any question?
So I already explained this program last time, but I will repeat. Okay, why? Because we will go further in details. Okay, so this is a simple program that loads a value stored at address 104, adds to it another value stored at address 105, and then stores the result in another address 106. Okay? So this is the job of this program, is to add two numbers and store the result in at a given address. Okay. What we will see now is what is happening inside the register. So how the values are changed inside the uh, CPU. So before discussing, I will want, want just to uh, remind you what is the difference between a compiler and an assembler. So a compiler compiles a high-level language, okay, and converts it to machine language, okay. AML assembly language is will will assemble a an assembly program, okay, to get the machine language from the assembly program. The difference is that a compiler one instruction, okay, compiled by a compiler why one high-level instruction, okay could have more than one machine instruction. Could be equivalent to more than one machine instruction. While each assembly instruction has only one machine instruction. Okay? So if I'm writing A equal A plus B, equal A plus B, in a high level language, we need to get, if, if we are using Marie for instance, we need to get the first operand added to the second one, B, and store the result in A, okay? So we have three instructions, so three different machine instructions when traduced to machine language. But each assembly will be converted into only one machine language, okay? So we say that the assembly program is called the source file and the assembler converts a source file to an object file which contains only bits, okay, binary numbers. So here, let's go back. Now we knew what, I what is an assembler. Now let's see, we've seen how the fetch decode execute is done. I will take other example. Uh, so what I explained on the board is the same here, but on a table. Okay, so you have here all the registers and what happens in, during the fetch, decode, and execute cycle. Okay? I explained that, so I will take another example. Okay? Just to show you how you can use the table. So let's say we'll add 105 instruction. Okay? So at first during the fetch, I need to get the add 105. Okay, which is stored at a given address inside the memory. Okay, and this given address is inside the PC. Okay, for example, at first the PC will be stored in the memory address register, and what we have at this address will be stored in the instruction register. This is the fetch. Okay, so now the instruction is in the instruction register. So now my default initial values. Here we have these values. Okay, what we have inside here. Okay, after the first execution. Okay, so we executed load 104 and this changed the uh, values of the uh, registers. Okay? Now we have these values what is happening during the next fetch decode execute. Okay? Now the PC contains 101, okay, that is the address of the next instruction which is add 105. Okay? During the fetch, the PC will be stored inside the MAR. The MAR previously in load 104 contained the address of the operand. It was 105, 104. Okay, load 104. Okay, so we get 104 from the memory previously. So 104 now will be replaced by the content of the PC. Why? Because I need to get the instruction. Okay, so um, what changes is highlighted in blue. Okay, the register that is changed is highlighted in blue. So here only MAR has changed. 
which is new value is the content of PC. Okay. Next, what we have added as the rest will be stored inside the instruction register. Okay. So what we have inside, in fact, the add 105, the add the opcode of add is the three. Okay, so it's in four bits, zero, zero, one, one. Okay, this is the opcode of add, and this is the address part, 105. So what we fetch this value from memory and store it inside the instruction register. Okay, all other registers doesn't change. Okay, they do not change the contents of these registers. Only the instruction register, what is changing now. Okay, then we will increment the PC by one to prepare the address of next instruction. Okay, so we have 101, that is the address of this instruction, and now at the end of the fetch process, the new address is 102, which is the address of store 106, next instruction. Okay? Now, the decode, we said that we will decode the, uh, the instruction from value 3, the CPU, our control unit, know that this is an add instruction, okay? So, by default, it puts the uh, address part inside the memory address register, okay? Python 105, whatever is the instruction, always the address part will be stored in the MAR. Why? Because most probably we need to get an output, okay, before execution. So this is the address part will be stored in the MAR. Now, when decoding, Faisal, what we will have in the MAR is the address part 105, okay? The address part of this instruction, that is 105. So what changes is uh, here, 105 will be stored in the MAR, okay? Uh, what about? The uh, IR. The IR doesn't change. The instruction what we have in the, in the instruction register is the instruction that is being executed. What we fetch from the memory. That is the 3105, that is add 105. And it is still like that until the next fetch uh, decode execute cycle. Okay? For instance, here, we, we, before we executed, we fetched, decoded, and executed load 104. So what do you expect we have inside the instruction register at the end of the fetch decode execute? It's load 104. So in the instruction register, you will find at the end of the execution, 1104, one, one is the opcode of load, and 104 is, is this address, okay? So yani, don't think that going from an, a fetch cy a cycle to another cycle, all registers will be cleared, no. It contains the same, the previous content, okay? Until it is changed in the next uh, fetch decode execute cycle. So going back here, so during the decode, as we've said, we have in the memory address register the address part, and then the CPU decodes. What should I do? The control unit asks itself, what should I do? So it knows here that uh, it's an add instruction, so an ad needs to get the operand. We need to get an operand. So we need to go at address 105 that is stored inside the memory address register, okay, to get the operand. And when we get the operand, the value will be stored in the memory buffer register, the MDR, okay? So we go to our CPU accesses the address 105 and finds in it the FFE9, okay, I recall. What we have at address 105 is FFE9, okay? So what, this control, what the control unit uh, takes from address MAR is FFE9. And where it stores it, it's, it stores it in the MBR. So this value will be stored in the MBR, okay? Finally, I need to execute. So this, I prepare the patch and decode the instruction, now I need to execute. During the execution process, the MBR will be added to the accumulator and what we, uh, value will be stored inside the accumulator. And what is the content of the accumulator? What was the content of the accumulator? What is the content of the accumulator? It is not changed, 
okay, until the execution of add 105. And in fact, it contains the content of address 104, that is, the output load 105, 104. After load 104, the accumulator contains 0023. And this will not change till we execute the add 105. Okay? Inside the accumulator, we'll, we will have the sum. Okay, 0023 plus FFE9. Remind you, complement 2 system. Okay? So the result is 00Z uh, in hexadecimal, which is the value 12. Okay, L same idea for store. Okay, so I'll not explain, you can read it carefully at home. Okay, you need by, you need by following the same strategy. Okay. So this is also explained how to use, previously explained how to use labels and directives in an assembly, Marie assembly program. So the final point today is uh, we will extend our instruction set architecture. What we've seen are nine instructions. Okay, load, store, input, output, and so on. Let's get gone. And add, subtract, we'll jump, uh, and halt. So now we will learn new instructions that are jump and store, clear, add indirect, jump indirect, load indirect, and store indirect. Okay, I will start with the easiest one. That is clear. Okay, clear only clears the content of the accumulator. So it stores zero inside the accumulator. That's all. Okay? One uh, common use for clear, if, if you want to calculate uh, the negative value, okay, of a value stored inside the memory. So you will clear the accumulator and subtract the value at address x. So if x contains 5 in decimal, when you clear, if you write clear, then subtract x, you will have 0 minus what you have at address x. So if you have 5, you will have in the accumulator minus 5. Okay? So and there are other uses for clear, but this is one of the applications. Um, jump and store. We've seen jump, jump instruction. So the jump instruction stores uh, in the PC a new address. So we will jump from one instruction to another while, while executing. Okay? The jump and store is used if we want to uh, jump to a function or a procedure, okay? And then go back to our program. If you use uh, high-level language programming, you know that you will write your main program somewhere, and you will write your previously defined functions and procedures to be called from the main program, okay? So for example, you will write a function using a, uh, any syntax of any uh, language, but this is just an example, an illustrative example. So in fact, you will execute, okay, and here, at this point, you will go back here to execute this program, and when you finish, you need to go back, okay? This is a typical example of jump and sort. Before, in fact, before uh, going to the function program that is stored somewhere in the memory, you need to store the content of your PC, okay? What you have in the uh, PC. Why? Because we need to go back to the program, okay? To the point where we left, okay? 
فإذاً جامب أند ستور وات إز ذا جوب أوف جامب أند ستور؟ إت ستورز ذا كونتنت أوف ذا بي سي أت أدرس إكس أوكي أند ذن جامب تو إكس بلس 1 أوكي سو وات ويل هابن وين وي هاف جي إن إس إكس أند ليت سبوز إنسايد ذا سي بي يو Inside the CPU, we have the PC. But our next address is 101. And here we have So the PC now contains the address of the next instruction. Okay? So it will be fetched to the instruction register. Okay? It will contain jump and store X. Okay? And X is somewhere here. And at address X plus 1, we have our function. Okay? We have our program related to the function. Okay? So we will go store. Uh, okay, finally we have one. Right. So during the uh, decode process, what happens? The CPU knows that this is a jump and so. So it jumps at address X. Okay? Keep in mind, after the fetch, after fetching the jump and store instruction, the PC will be incremented by one. Okay? So after the, during the execution, we know that the PC is 102. Okay? The address of the next instruction in our program. Okay? Now, during the execution of jump and store, we need to jump to address X, but before jumping to address X plus one, but before jumping to address X, we will store at address X here what we have in the PC. Okay, so we will store 102 at address X. Then we need to jump to X plus one. After storing the value of PC, the PC value will change, will change to X plus one. Okay? During the execution of this instruction. Okay? As an after the execution, the control unit reads the content of PC. It goes here instead of going here. Okay? Execute the program. As a command by default now, we need to go back. Okay? To address, uh, to the address that is stored at address X. Here. Okay? So we need an instruction that put inside the PC, okay, the value of address X. What we learn is that jump X, we, will, we need to jump somehow, okay? But we, we know that jump X, okay, jumps to address X, okay? But what we need now is to jump to what is stored inside address X, okay? So in fact, the X is not the effective address. The X is a pointer to the address, okay? So what provides us with this functionality or this feature? It's the jump inline X, okay? Which is a new instruction. So in fact, the jump indirect x in all the uh, following instructions that I will explain, you will have this type to say that what we are using is an indirect address. Okay? What does this mean? 
Jump in direct x. Jump in direct x means that we are not giving the address, the effective address in the address bar, but we are giving the address of the open. Okay? So in fact, jump in direct x, the PC the CPU goes to address x, takes the value, okay, and jump to it. Okay? In fact, we need to jump to a given address. Jump x, we are directly jumping to address x. Jump in direct, we are not directly jumping to address x, no. We are jumping to the content of address. So what is given, what is given here is the address of the address. Okay? So I will explain here. Jump in direct x, when it's executed, okay? It goes to address x, it will control it, goes to address x during the execution of this instruction, reads what we have here, 102, and store it in the PC. It will be stored here. So after executing jump in direct x, the control unit fetches what we have at address 1. End of the program. Previous program. Okay, so we went back to the previous program using jump and store and jump in direct. Okay? Jump, regular jump. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not listening. Jump. Yeah. Jump X? No, it jumps direct to address X. From direct to address. If I have jump X. What we have here, the instruction. If I have jump X instead of jump in direct. If I have jump X, okay, after the execution, we will jump here. And consider it as an instruction and not a value. Okay, and finally jump X stores in the PC X. It's stored in the PC X. So if I write jump X, what will be stored is X. So during the next phase, we go the C control unit goes to address X, read the content, and store it in the instruction register. So it will give us a problem, an error. Okay? Lish Lanu, you need to not understand that this is an instruction. This is an address, really. Okay? So we need to put jump in direct to say that X is not Munsamiya effective address. Okay? It's the address of the effective address. Okay? So same for all others, okay? Same idea, add indirect, load indirect, store indirect. Let's take load indirect. Load X reads what we have at address X and store it in the accumulator. Load indirect X, it goes to address X, reads the value, okay? Not take this value and store it in the accumulator, no. It's the address of the open, so it go, goes to other address, Read the content and store it in the accumulator. I'll give an example. So, say load indirect x, and let's say. This is x, contains the value 101, okay, and 101 contains the value 23 in this thing. So when I write load ix, I will start with load x to show you the difference. So load x, what we will have in the accumulator is the content of addresses, so it's 101. Okay. So I will add zero because the accumulator is 16 bits. Okay. And if we have load indirect x, okay, load indirect x goes to address x, reads the address, the real address of the open, goes to 101, read this value and store it in the accumulator. So what will be stored in the accumulator here is 
23 in this one. Okay? Same for all others. The add indirect, the store indirect. So instead of storing at address X, we will read from X the address inside which we want to store. Okay? So CPU goes to address X, read the new address, okay, and store the accumulator at this effective address. Okay? Lad indirect, same idea. The operand is not at address X, but the address of this operand is at address X. Okay? Go to address X, read the address, go to this new address, read this value, and this value will be added to the accumulator and stored inside the accumulator. Okay? So now let's go to the um, register transfer language for these instructions. So starting with the clear, the clear only clears the content of the accumulator, so it's all zero in the accumulator. Okay? In fact, it will send a clear signal to the uh, accumulator to, to, to start to uh, store inside it all, the, all zeros. Now, jump and store. Okay, the jump was very simple. Okay, it's only uh, store the X at address at the PC, inside the PC. So, X, PC. So now, we need to go to address X, store the content of the accumulator, calculate X plus one, and store it in the PC. So this is what happens. We need to get to store at address X, right? Paisan at first, and what we want to store, the content of the PC at address X. So what we need to store should be written inside MBR. So we will store the content of PC inside MBR. Address X at AR, and what we will store at this address, at address X, is the content of MBR, which is PC. Okay, so we will store at this, at this stage, we are storing the PC at address MAR, which is address X. Then, we need now to uh, change the value of the PC to X plus 1. So at first we need to calculate X plus 1. So we will put X in the MBR, okay, then 1 to the accumulator, and then add the content of the accumulator to MBR, which is X plus 1 and store it in the accumulator. And finally, the accumulator will be stored in the PC. So X plus one will be stored inside the PC. Okay? Now on indirect addressing, you will load and <coughs> load I, store I, add I, and so on, jump I. You will find the same RTL you previously seen but with two additional lines. Alatul Ancon, two additional lines. Why? Because we need to get the new, the, the real address. Okay, so for example, load RTL in load. Okay, you stored X at MAR. Okay, then directly get what you have in MAR at MBR and store MBR in the accumulator. Okay, now we added two lines. So we'll go to X, we'll go to X and get a value from X which is the address of the author. So this address will be stored to MAR. Why? Because we need to go back to the memory to read the author. Okay? So go to address X, read the value, which is the new address. Okay? So MBR will be stored at MAR. We will go to this new address and store the result in the MBR, which is the value we need to store inside the accumulator. Okay? So why? Because we are using indirect addressing. We are not giving the address of the operand. We are giving the address of the address of the operand. Okay? Storing direct size, same idea. The store, you put it X in MAR, and then directly the accumulator with MBR, MBR accumulator. Okay? You have the same two lines. Okay? Same two lines. Okay? Because you have the address of the address. Bell jump indirect, you directly jump X in PC. That's it, the jump. Jump indirect, no. What we need to store inside the PC is not X, but the content of address X. So X in MAR, MMAR in MBR, and MBR contains the content of X. It will be stored in the PC. Same for add, but add indirect, we put it X at MAR, we get the content of MAR at MBR, and we add an MBR to the accumulator, you will find these two lines. 
Okay? So always same two lines. So this is an example okay, to practice Mari. And here ends our lecture. Any question? So I would like to thank you for your attendance and your patience.